time. We're ready? Okay. Well, hello. <laughs> Thank you guys for coming. Uh, I'm Courtney Bell. This is? I'm Trisha Shales. Nice to meet you all. We work for Low Incidence Consulting Services. We're a fabulous group of vision, O&M, DHH teachers. We have some assistants in there. And uh, we are serving the South Central area of Wisconsin. We're in the public schools, uh, kind of around the Madison area and around the Milwaukee area. And today we are running through Vision 101, we called it. It's, um, it's going to be a very fast load of information that we're going to give you. Um, and I figure we'll, we'll just get through it and then save questions for the end. Um, and hopefully you enjoy getting some of this information about what you need to know about having a kiddo in school with a visual impairment. So I'm going to pass it to Trisha. She's going to take care of the first uh, few sections. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to go over just really quickly are some visual impairments. And obviously, if you have a, a kiddo with a visual impairment, you are probably pretty well schooled on yours. So um, this is just going to be kind of a quick rundown. But I think one of the things that's really important to understand is that some children are born with visual impairments right out of the box. Something happened in utero, maybe a genetic disorder, and some of those things can be such things as pediatric glaucoma, congenital blindness, coloboma, congenital cataract, retinal dystrophies, um, retinitis pigmentosa is one of those. Some children are born without eyes or without eyes that are fully developed. And a lot of um, children have nystagmus, which if you're familiar with that term, it means shaking of the eyes um, in some form or other. But sometimes our visual impairments in our kids, they appear later. And um, these are examples of things that are not present at birth that may happen, you know, when the child is it may have it might be something that the pediatrician finds. It might be something that you start noticing. Um, retinopathy of prematurity, that happens if a child is born prematurely and, and gets too much oxygen. Um, it doesn't happen as much as it used to, but very, very premature babies, oftentimes it does. Um, neuroblastoma or cancer of the eye can happen again at any time. Um, you may be familiar with myopia and hyperopia, which is basically you know what many of us get glasses for being able to see not as well distance, not as well near, but oftentimes that affects very young children. Amblyopia, known as lazy eye, um, strabismus. That a lot of people think of it as crossed eyes, but it's really when your eyes aren't aligned. So they may not appear crossed, but you may have one, you notice your child's looking out in one direction and the other eyes straight ahead. So um, that can be a lot of different combinations. Stargardt disease, um, cone rod dystrophies, which can impact, you know, color blindness, a lot of things like that. Uh, if you have a child who's a type one diabetic, diabetic retinopathy is, is something that you have to be careful of. Children who get traumatic brain injuries, that can often affect the visual part of the brain or brain surgery. If a child has a brain tumor and they have to have the tumor removed again, the area of the brain that controls vision can be impacted by that or a traumatic injury to the eye itself. So neurological visual impairments are one of the things that um, as a TVI, I see often. And it's because the brain has as much to do with how well we see as our eyes do often. So if it's a neurological visual impairment, there's been some kind of issue with the brain. Maybe the child had a stroke or um, somehow the brain did not form correctly in utero, or there was, again, you know, some horrible accident where the brain was impacted. So that, can, that damage to the brain can also cause damage to our vision. And the eyes themselves may be perfectly fine, but for some reason, that connection between the brain and the eye um, isn't working correctly. And a lot of times we see children who have these neurological visual impairments in combination with things like um, cerebral palsy, muscular weakness, hearing loss, cognitive impairment, and um, some nonverbal or difficulty with speech. 
The most common thing, um, the most common visual impairment today in children is cortical visual impairment or CVI. And the most common cause of that is the most of the students that I see with CVI were born that way, okay? Um, again, it's a neurologic problem that affects the visual part of the brain and the eyes themselves, the physical look of the eyes, the actual physiology of the eyes is perfectly normal. Kids with CVI, they there are some really typical characteristics that we'll see. We'll see that they tend to have a color preference. And as a parent, once you find that color preference, it's awesome. And many of our kids, it's yellow or red or orange. And we can really tell that when they're looking at something in those colors or in their preferred color, that they look at that longer. So that's something, if you have a child with CVI, make note of what colors seem to attract them most and what ones that they pay the most attention to. Um, they also often have a delayed visual response. And that means like if somebody walks in their line of vision or if you hold up a toy, it takes them more time. You know, it's not an automatic turn of the head. It takes them more time to look at it and focus. They have a preference for looking at lights. They love things. A lot of times they'll visually attend to things that light up or spin or movement, that type of thing um, as well. So toys that provide those kind of things, lighting up colorful, spinning or some kind of movement are a really good choice. And you'll notice in that picture, those are just like, you know, those streamers. But um, again, they've got that, they've got that metallic red, they move a little bit. So um, those are something that, that are a good choice. And then the other thing about children with CVI is they have a harder time with visual stimuli that's not familiar to them. So that makes it difficult in a school setting because kids are experiencing a lot of things in a school setting that are unfamiliar. And so it's really important to recognize that and make sure that we're providing them with the support they need. Um, visual field. Visual field is just, you know, the area that we see in. And if you have, you know, relatively normal vision, you and I are seeing this whole area, right? But Children with CVI, we really can't get inside there and see out of their eyes and what they're seeing. But oftentimes you'll notice that a child with CVI will turn their head and be looking out of their peripheral vision. Um, that happens very often. And very possibly their central vision, they just don't see well that way. There's some kind of a, a block there. Um, they tend to see better close up than at a distance. Um, I have one little boy on my caseload who, if his mom would walk into the room, he would not know she was there unless she was about less than 24 inches from him. So their, their distance vision oftentimes is, you know, is really, really small. Obviously every single child is totally different, but um, that's just something that we have to be aware of. And the other, the good thing about CVI is that it's one of the few visual impairments where we actually can see some improvement over time and with the right types of supports. Parents and teachers um, can help the children move through the different stages of CVI. And the way we do that will be kind of more explained on the next slide. To begin with, you want to provide your child with like a black background and very little, they call it visual clutter. And this means very few items. You start out with one, um, very simple. So for example, in this picture, you'll notice the duck, that particular word is circled in what they call Roman word bubbling. And Roman word bubbling um, is actually a, a website. It's, it's a, that you can just click, you can just Google it, Roman word bubbling, and you can write and print out anything you want to, any word that you want, several different font choices, and you can determine what color you want around it based on your child's favorite or color of choice. Um, so that is a great website if you aren't familiar with that. Um, you'll also notice in the second picture where they've got the light on the on the zebra, 
and they've only got the two animals on there. Um, lighting things can also help your child attend to those. And again, just very few items on a black background. And often too, um, if your child has CVI, oftentimes their lower vision is harder for them. So having it kind of propped up in front of them rather than laying flat on a table is also really helpful. Light boxes are great for CVI. Um, a light box, you can um, you know, put anything on it from solid items like the picture on the right or items that are more um, translucent or transparent on the left. And I also saw that on the iPad, they, there are sites that have um, a light box app. So like you could even use an iPad for a light box if you don't have one. And this is talking about finding your child's preferred color, like I was talking about before. And that's kind of, you know, you just have to kind of experiment with that. But um, you'll notice in each of these pictures, the items are all one color, yellow, green, red. And uh, so that's really helpful once you, once you figure that out. And then this is just a slide that shows slowly increasing complexity. And by complexity, here, we're just really talking about adding more items to increase their visual load. So starting out with just that one orange fish, you may be doing months of just one item on a black background, you know, and gradually increasing it. And, um, you know, it all depends on the individual child, how many items you can put in front of them that they can visually attend to. That's something that, you know, depending on if your child is verbal, you can like in that second picture, I might say, can you point to the car or can you touch the car or can you look at the car and um, then say, can you look at the pony? Do they turn their head? Do they turn it so that they're looking out their peripheral vision? Those are all good things for you to know as a parent. And then something that's super important is to provide hands-on experience. So a lot of times, if you think about it as a visual person, we take in information constantly in our environment. We aren't being directly taught things. We're just taking in the fact that um, that man back there, he's got a blue and white platter checked shirt. You know, I'm just taking that in visually. Whereas if you have a child with a visual impairment, they're not going to be picking up the kinds of information from the environment that we do. So we want to provide them as many different ways to take in information as we possibly can. Things like tactile books, tactile games, um, giving them real objects to compare to photographs of an object. Um, so all those things can be helpful. All right, so the next part I'm going to talk about are TVIs. I'm a TVI, a teacher of the visually impaired. Um, I'm a newbie. I've only been doing this for three years. Before that, I was a classroom teacher, an ESL teacher, a mom, a foster mom, an adoptive mom. So um, I've been working with kids forever, but um, I love being a TVI. And I think that it's really important as a parent to understand what a TVI really can do for you, because we are a really great resource for you as parents. First of all, um, we don't just fall off the street. We are certified teachers. We have master's degrees. We've been educated in how to teach kids specifically who are visually impaired. We're a member of your child's IEP team so that when your child gets to school, we will also be at those IEP meetings with you. We can provide one-to-one -one vision services for your child, um, either in the home environment, if your child isn't in school yet, or at the, in the school environment. Um, we act as consultants. We can provide information for you. We can tell you, if you ask us a question, we can give you resources that can help you find the information that you need if we can't find it for you. Um, we often teach children Braille. Not every child is learning Braille, but that's something we also do. One of the most important things I think we do for our children who are in school is we really figure out how to create or prepare their school materials. We can request that things be enlarged if they need them enlarged. We can request that they're sitting right at the front of the room. Um, we can request that these books are ordered for them in Braille. All those things, our goal is to make your child have the easiest accessibility as they can to whatever curriculum is being used for them in the school environment. So we are really strong advocates for your child's visual needs. 
um, we can help provide access to different types of technology um, and support your child to learn that type of technology. So that's also really important. And um, also we can teach your child strategies to help them be able to more visually, more easily visually access whatever they need to in the school environment or in their, and also just in their regular environment. So what starts out, um, many of you have probably had this happen already. Your child is referred um, for an assessment, either maybe from a doctor, a family member, a sitter, somebody notices something's not happening, especially if this is um, a problem that you didn't notice at birth. Oftentimes we get um, referrals from schools, ophthalmologists. And so once that assessment refer, or once this referral starts, we start an assessment process. And will you, you're, you'll find your TVI or somebody will reach out to you and ask you if you have an ocular report from an eye doctor or ophthalmologist. And we also ask about your child's health history. Um, that can even include mom's pregnancy history if that has anything to do with your child's visual impairment. And then we do an assessment. We call it a functional vision assessment. And it's basically play-based. We just bring in a whole bunch of toys and we have different things that we're checking for. We're checking for your, the eye muscles to see if um, light bounces off the eyes evenly or if there's a difference. We're looking for to see if they can visually track things going across midline, if they can focus on, on something that we're showing them. We're looking for how well they see distance and near, which is acuity. Um, scanning. We're doing games with them, like I might have a toy on top of a pencil and ask the child, can you reach for that? Can you take that toy off my pencil? Checking to see what their depth perception is. Do they overreach, underreach, or can they, can they grab the toy? And basically, we're looking to see how functional or how well your child uses their vision in everyday life. So it's a different type of an assessment that you then you would get just going like to an ophthalmologist because we're really looking at function. Another part of that same assessment is the learning media assessment, especially when your child gets into school. This is important, but even before then, we want to decide what is the best pathway for your child to become literate, whether that's reading, whether it's looking at pictures, whether it's audiobooks. Um, is your child going to be a visual learner? Is your child going to be more of an auditory learner because they just don't have that vision? Or are we going to have to bring in a lot of tactile materials and braille? So we're looking at all those things when we meet with your child. We are looking for kids who are academic or who are, who are going to be readers. We're looking to see, is there a font size that we need to increase their work to so that they can visually access it? Um, and that they can comprehend it best. Do they need things magnified, enlarged? Um, how well can they visually scan and track? And this is something that for a lot of kids is really difficult. Oftentimes, especially when you get into middle school and high school, you have to look at the whiteboard and you have to copy things down on paper in front of you. You know, are they able to do that? Can they make that shift from looking up to looking down? And if not, how can we support that for them? And then based on how well your child visually accesses the world, that's how we determine vision el eligibility for services. We're really looking to see, can we help this child better visually access their world? And each child, your vision services are going to look very different. Some kids really need that one-to-one -one vision instruction. Some kids need one-to-one -one Braille instruction. Sometimes your TVI is really just kind of a consultant for your child so that we make sure that every year in school, they're paying attention to your child's visual needs and that those visual needs are written in your child's IEP. And then we go to the IEP meeting. Um, we meet with other professionals and you're there as a parent. And we look at all the different evaluations that were done for your child. And we advocate for your child's visual needs and determine what services are needed. And then your child's IEP is developed. And we use the vision goals that we've decided on between talking to you as parents 
and um, what the child needs in, in the classroom. We design lessons to help that child meet the goal or goals that we've set up for them visually. And you can see this little girl, she's obviously working on letters and they're enlarged quite a bit for her visual needs. And they're on that black background. Um, your TVI, they can help with adaptations, not only to use at school, but also if you're struggling at home. Um, adaptations are ways that we can change the environment or change objects so that visually impaired students can see them better. So for example, um, I, I love making tactile books. That's something I really enjoy doing. And the picture on the left is an example of a tactile book that the child you know, can, can manipulate as well as visually read if they have that ability. On the right, this would probably be more like a high school or middle school where we make tactile graphs and different things like that for math class so that children are better able to access what's um, happening in the classroom. Illumination is important and there's a difference. So you need to know your child. Is your child a child who does best in bright light or do they need more of a dim, you know, a dim setting? So I just pulled this picture because this is just an example of something a teacher could do to help reduce the visual load on a child. Another thing would be curtains on classroom windows, having a student sit with their back to the window so the light's coming in behind them so that they don't have to look at the light. And um, you know, wearing hats or visors or even sunglasses, both indoors and outdoors. So if your child is light sensitive, those are some things to consider. If you have a child on the other hand who needs more light, sitting near the windows with, with natural light. They may not wanna sit facing the light, but the light could be coming in on the side. If you put a lamp behind a, the child's shoulder so that it lights up the area in front of them on their desk, these are not, these are like Amazon lights, okay? They're not, these are specifically for kids who are visually impaired. No, 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 no. But the reason I wanted to put this up there is there are a lot of very expensive lights out there that you can get. But I love the fact that these have, you know, that ability to move them. And that's something I would always look for if you're looking for a way to light up a space for a visually impaired child so that the light can actually be, you know, changed without having to move the whole lamp. Um, color and contrast. This is something else we think about as TVIs. Black and white give the highest color contrast. But for kids who, are, uh, who have CVI, they found that Black and white are not the best colors. Um, we don't want to use dark colors together like blue and green. We avoid using white, gray, and other light colors together unless they're on a, ba a black background. Um, so contrasting colors. If you have a red, you don't want something like a purple right next to it. You want red and yellow, something very different. Um, using post-it notes in fluorescent colors can be helpful. Computers, iPads, even Chromebooks have settings that you can adjust so that you can get different contrasts of color. So if your child's in school, check with um, your TVI or the teacher to make sure that that's happening for them. A portable black background. Um, many of you may have heard of the all-in-one board. That's one of the best tools a lot of my kids use at school because it has a black Velcro board on one side and you flip it and it's a magnetic white board on the other side. And if your child receives um, funds, they, they can get that for free through um, APH, American Printing House for the Blind. Um, so that's a great tool. Um, using bright colored objects for daily life activities. Um, for example, a red bowl and a yellow spoon or some kind of contrasting colors like that can make it much easier for your child to do those types of activities. Using colored masking tape to highlight areas like where a coat needs to be hung. Or um, we've been fighting a couple battles this year because we've had schools that haven't had colored tape on the stair treads. So the stairs look like a big sheet of gray something. You know, the kid can't figure out where the next step is. So we've had to request school districts put that contrasting color on stairs for kids. So all those things can also be used at home as well. 
I have a very blind dog right now and he's having trouble going down our stairs and I'm thinking of putting <laughs> colored strips on it for him. I don't know if that'll help. Here's just some examples of that. Um, the spoon in the bowl, you can see how the inside of the bowl is a very contrasting color to that yellow spoon. And same with that pitcher. So, you know, teaching your children these type of tasks, these daily tasks, so important. You do it with any kid. You need to do it with kids with visual impairments as well. Make them as independent as they can possibly be. Here's an example of a large font keyboard. Almost everything can be made into large font these days. This one you can also see has the yellow and black, which is you know a very good contrasting color. So those are available um, for school. There's tons of iPad apps available like this as well. Big key computers on the or big key um, calculators on the iPad. You can download fonts for that. There's all kinds of stuff. Size and distance. Um, most students with low vision will benefit from some kind of magnification. Just like with the contrast, you can increase the magnification settings on your computers. Um, large print books and textbooks can be ordered. Um, many low-tech magnification devices are also useful. We have a whole box full of different types of magnifiers that are handheld or dome magnifiers that a child can slide across a page in order to magnify reading materials, the keyboard like we saw. Um, preferred seating, again, knowing if your kid is one of those ones that's looking out the right side all the time, you know, where's the best place for him to be in the classroom? Or always making sure that these teachers are paying attention and they're giving your child that priority seating in the best place where they need to be. May not always be the front of the room depending on the child or where the teacher's presenting. So it's really important for a child to be close to a screen if the teacher presents on a screen a lot or close to the teacher herself if the teacher does a lot of presenting um, even in front of her desk or wherever she chooses to be. So preferred seating just isn't always front and middle. It really depends on the student and the teacher. Um, making sure that your child is always allowed to move closer to things in the classroom. If they're showing a movie, maybe they need to move closer to the screen teachers writing on the whiteboard, moving closer to the whiteboard, um, making large print flashcards, enlarging classwork and homework. These are really simple fixes, but a lot of times we still need to put these in the IEP because without them, we can't come back later and say, hey, you know, you haven't been enlarging this stuff on the copy machine for this child. And they're like, well, I know we talked about that, but it didn't get put in the IEP. So we want to really make sure that all of the things your child needs is written down in that document. And here's some examples. As you probably all well know, I, um, an iPad is great because you can just enlarge it like this. And there's also, like I said, a ton of great games and um, different apps that are specifically for children with visual impairments and adults with visual impairments. A large print book, those can be ordered. Um, if your child, doesn't need braille, but just needs something enlarged, those are also available. The school orders that, school pays for that. So if your child needs a large print math book or a large print reading book, you know, those things can be ordered and should be ordered. And that's part of your TBI's job as well. Make sure they are. Organization. If you can imagine, um, any child with a visual impairment is going to need probably more organization in their environment than um, than a norm, you know, than a regular kid. Because if they have a very, um, if they use a cane or if visually moving around in an environment is difficult, you know, a backpack on the floor, they can trip over. Um, so <clears throat> reducing as much of the clutter within an environment is really important. And again, that's something we have to talk to a teacher about in a classroom. Sitting a child where they need to be in the classroom in order to take in the information is not always the best place for that child in terms of movability. You know, if they have to walk around 12 different desks and kids' backpacks are on the floor in order to go out the door to go to the bathroom, that needs to change. So reducing the amount of clutter, literal clutter, 
um, is really important for our kids with visual impairments. Labeling items, again, in the bright contrast and colors, reducing just the sheer amount of papers on a kid's desk by having them have just one binder can be really helpful. Um, and obviously it's so helpful if your child is part of the development of this process, because if they are, they'll buy into it more than if you do it all for them. Um, visual or tactile schedules can be a great help for a child with a visual impairment, because again, they may not be able to see up on the board where the teacher has the daily schedule. They may need something right on their desk that may just be pictures or they may be, you know, in large words or even tactile. Um, if a student's moving class to class, like will happen, um, late elementary, middle school, and high school, we want to make sure that their organization is portable um, and is easily moved from classroom to classroom. And oftentimes, children, as they get into high school, you know, talking in, or even middle school, talking into a phone, making, um, talking into a phone in terms of what homework they have. That type of thing can be more useful than expecting them to write everything down because that's that can be really difficult and very time consuming for them. Here's an example of some tactile and visual cards and schedules. And these are really simple ones. Um, you'll notice where they have actual, like the one on the left has the actual objects adhered to the cards. ETH has a fork. Um, clean up has a sponge. So my guess is that this is for a child who probably is blind and need, really needs that tactile um, opportunity so that if they feel the fork, they know it's time for lunch. If they feel the sponge, they know it's time to clean up. And then um, this one on the right, they have different shapes of foam that indicate different things in the classroom. And there's lots of different ways to do this. And then um, this is my last slide, and then I'm going to hand it over to Courtney. I think one of the hardest things is to avoid learned helplessness. Ultimately, in the back of your mind, if you can just remember that the most important thing for your child, no matter what their disabilities or abilities, we really want them to become as independent as they possibly can. And it may take them longer. It may be frustrating for us to let them try things on their own but it's so important. And um, as a TVI, I find that to be really important. I, you want to challenge your child. And you know sometimes it's frustrating, but challenge them and provide that support that they need. Because again, you know we're looking forward. We're looking beyond your child being two to being 10, to being 20. We want them to have developed these, these personal living skills so that they can be as independent people as they possibly can grow to be. All right, it's all you. Goodness. Well, thank you, Trisha. Super informative. We're gonna keep it rolling. Still tons of information to cover. Oh, look at the cuties. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, that wasn't my last slide. <laughs> yeah, you can get tinted glasses. That's the cool part too. Okay, I'm gonna talk about the expanded core curriculum and it applies to all of your children. Technically, I would say it applies to well. Uh, sorry, my microphone fell here. Alrighty, so we're gonna pop right into it. How many are you of you are familiar with the expanded core curriculum in any way? Awesome, awesome. Not a whole lot of people, so just um, this will be great. This will be great for you then. Uh, it's basically a big list of skills that are. Uh, you specifically need to teach them to children with visual impairments. There are things that you can miss that you don't uh, just pick up on incidentally. And your TVI and o &M instructor and other people in on the IEP team can help arrange for those skills to be taught. So we're going to kind of quickly run through all of them. But please, if you have questions, just write it down and uh, uh, we, we can stay after. We can have a little powwow afterwards and talk about any of the questions or concerns that you have in case we run out of time. But I'll try to keep it chugging along here. So compensatory skills. I think of that as how you compensate for your visual impairment. Study skills, organizational skills, concept development. Are you using models, braille? How are you getting your information that's um, slightly different from how the peers are? And then your modes of communication. There are just so many ways to communicate, magnification, print, braille, sign language, tactile cards, 
assistive language devices, recording, screen readers, keyboards, it just goes on and on. We've got sensory efficiency. So aside from taste, uh, touch, smell, hearing, all that, there's also proprioception, which is knowing where your body is in space. If you think about uh, when you're walking, you don't have to look at where your foot is going, or you might send a text message, even, uh, even though you're on a touchscreen uh, phone, you kind of know where the letters are. Uh, your vestibular sense is your sense of balance and movement and focusing on all of these areas and helping kids understand uh, how they can utilize all of these senses better. It really does increase their opportunities. It helps them gather information about their world and every every bit we can get, every every little bit more that we can add on to their experience and their understanding of the world is so important. And then we've got self-determination is another area of the expanded core curriculum. This kind of falls in line with self-advocacy, knowing who you are, what you want, how to get what you want. Um, there's a picture here that says, I can't do it. And there's some scissors snipping off the T because we want our kids to know that they can do it. We want them to understand their strengths and limitations and um, develop all of their own interests and pursue the life that they want, whatever that looks like for them. We look at career education. It looks completely different for every age group and where they're where they are at in their um, experience. But early childhood, it might be more play based, role playing. Elementary school gets a little bit more into some chores and their interests. Their personalities really come through of what they're um, excited about. You have, you know, your little kids that you're like, oh, they they have that caretaker personality or some kids that are like, you are obsessed with cars. We have to do something with cars for you. Um, and that absolutely, even if they're not going to drive, they can still be involved with cars. Um, middle school, they start to maybe do some volunteer work. Hopefully um, they start to maybe even some real work, work for your friends and your family. And they start to refine those organizational skills. And my favorite thing about the middle school age is they start to actually get a lot more feedback from your family, your friends, the people that they're with in the community. And that feedback helps them kind of understand where they're functioning compared to others. And, um, you know, they, they start to become very self-aware and realize like, oh, I guess I should be, you know, so-and-so's doing that for themselves. I should probably pick it up a little bit. So I love that kind of influence that social, um, that that the community has on the kids. And then there's high school. Uh, this There's a lot of intense planning in high school. Where are they going to be once high school is over? Whether they're in the you know transition program up to 21 or they uh, get hooked up with a service called DVR, Department of Vocational Rehabilitation. They are amazing. They help get equipment that your kid's gonna need after school. Because, you know, you've got, let's say you've got a great tool that the school purchased and you're like, well, what happens after we leave school? They don't have this tool anymore. Well, there are services that will buy that for you. So you don't have to spend your money on that necessarily. Um, and they'll give them the skills and they'll do, they'll go to the on the job training with them. And uh, high school is kind of where it all kind of comes together. And you start to think about what it's going to look like afterwards. Um, independent living skills. Another one, I'm going to just tell you every one of these areas is the most important area. Every single one of them is the most important. So when I say that, just know that I mean also all of it is. <laughs> so independent living skills uh, for the little kids, it might look like packing up their own backpack, taking care of their own personal body and hygiene, grooming. Um, as they get a little bit older, we teach them food preparation and cooking. We will actually pull your child out of their class if we need to and be like, this is how you make a sandwich, because that is important for them to be able to do their own laundry, money management, personal organization, household maintenance. You can teach them how to use a saw, use your discretion. Um, <laughs> but, you know, you want your kid to have all of the experiences. And, you know, a lot of our students have uh, unique ways that they use their body or unique cognitive abilities that make these things need modifications. And your TVI can help you brainstorm for what your goals are at home. If you're like, I really want my kid to help me saw this tree down. I don't know why you would, it's Earth Day. I should not be talking about chopping trees down. I am so sorry, Earth. But um, that's the example we're rolling with. Uh, and I don't know how I'm gonna modify a saw to make it safer, but we can talk about it when the time comes, if that's what we wanna do with our with our lives here. 
we have a picture of a teenager making some French fries. Uh, she's got her cane folded up on the table. She looks really happy because teenagers would probably live off of French fries if we let them, visually impaired or not. And uh, I just, I just want to impress. It's really important for our students to have uh, as many opportunities to be independent as possible. I know Trisha was kind of trying to ingrain that into your brains too, but um, I, you know, it, it takes them a little bit longer. It might look a little choppy or a little awkward. Uh, and it, you know, you're sitting there in the in the corner of the kitchen watching them put the peanut butter on the bread, and you're like, "It's a knife. My child has a knife," and you're you're worried, but just let it let it happen you know use your intuition as a as a parent and a caretaker but um let them have that opportunity we learn from our failed experiences more than we learn from our successes that's a quote from somebody famous somewhere i'm sure uh <laughs> we've got our social skills there's a picture here of three very cute children playing with blocks and building toys kind of passing them around um sometimes when you grow up with a visual impairment it's harder to pick up on some of the social cues things like uh, visual recognition and um, facial. facial facial recognition. Thank you. Like sensing emotions. There's, you know, there's things that you get really in tune to. And there are things that you might need a TVI to help um, help you understand, you know, ooh, everyone's being really quiet in this room. Maybe you should whisper to the person next to you to find out what's going on or raise your hand instead of blurting out loud. You know, there's some things need to be explicitly taught involving social skills. And I also just want to um, bring up human sexuality, interpersonal relationships, and self-control. I think it's really important that all of these things are involved in your child's education. And you kind of have to work together with your IEP team and the teachers in their life to find a way that you all feel comfortable with. Maybe that means, um, you know, like when you're talking about sex ed with your kid, that might mean having a, you know, teacher of the same gender working with your child. Um, but it's it's a really important topic that should not be avoided just because it's uncomfortable for some of us. So I just wanted to throw that personal opinion in there. Uh, recreation and leisure skills. This is in school, like PE, but it's also at home. If you're like my kid loves um, my kid loves swimming or wants to play frisbee with their friends, um, whatever it is, ask your TVI. They can or your O and M instructor. They can help you come up with ways to modify it or just give you resources and tools that you can use. But PE is always um, an interesting one to modify. Uh, we want our kids to have all of the same experiences. So sometimes that means modifying the materials like balls with jingles in them and a sound source. Like if you put a little beeping tone up by the basketball net, it's easier to you know, tell where you're shooting for. But we, I, I will also modify the children. I will put bells on all of the kids if they're playing capture the flag so that the one child in there who cannot see can find all of the kids to rip the flags off of them. And uh, everybody loves it. I've never had a, a, you know, a sighted peer complain about these cool modifications. We'll blindfold all the kids so everything's fair and they all have to do blind bowling. It's just, it's so much fun. And it's good to get creative, but... I do just have to point out, it gets overlooked all the time because everyone's so focused on the academics. They're focused on how are we going to get reading and writing and math and how are they going to get to art and what are they going to do once they're there? But, um, you know, just simply being there in PE isn't enough in my mind. And the more we can do to make it a fully immersive experience, the better. So that was a lot of information. I'm going to break it uh, break it up a little bit here. We've covered compensatory skills, sensory efficiency, self-determination, career education, independent living, social skills, recreation, and leisure. And I am going to go into assistive technology and orientation and mobility, but I have a lot more to say about those. So I kind of put them in their own little section here. Um, I just, uh, I have in bold letters, reminder, uh, it is easy to overlook some of these areas. They should all have IEP goals, maybe not every single one of them. You kind of pick and choose what you think is the most important to focus on. But some districts, um, some districts, it's, I, I never have to explain why we're working on building, making sandwiches. They understand that fully. And other districts don't understand why we would include that because they want to focus on the reading and the writing and the math. And your TBI will be well-versed in the expanded core curriculum, the ECC. 
and they will be on your side. But you guys might have to kind of team up together and explain to your district or your LEA rep, you know, someone from the school who's sitting in the meeting with you and be like, no, we really do deserve to have goals. Our child has the right to these goals. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not based on preference. It's based on need because without education in these areas, your child might not even ever have access to it. And we don't want that. We don't want that. Okay, we're gonna go into assistive tech. I'm so passionate about assistive technology. You can do anything with technology these days. It's so exciting. It can help you with seeing, communicating, remembering, listening, touching, reading, travel, navigation, the whole shebang. We've got a kid um, in this picture, they're in a wheelchair and they have a, a mounted screen on a bar that's connected to the wheelchair. So wherever they go, that screen is mounted probably for their visual needs so they can see it well. And for their mobility needs, maybe they can reach it well. It's a touch screen, maybe for communication. We don't know, but there is something for everyone. There's a, a child here using a monocular. It's a like a binocular with only one side to it, and it's for distance viewing. And uh, we're <laughs> you have to get kind of creative with where you sneak in the assistive technology. Sometimes um, it's it's hard to pull kids out of things. Everything's so important. Everything they're doing in school is important and it's hard to find times to pull them out to work on keyboarding or go outside and work on O&M and use some cool, you know, GPS navigation. But it's super, it's super important to find time for that. Your team is going to help you figure out the right assistive technology. Personally, the way that I like to do it as a TBI is, um, I consider what it, what is the child struggling with that there's tech that can help with. Most of the time, it ends up being distance viewing. A lot of times the kid is sitting at their desk, they can't see the board, and instead of getting up and moving closer, there might be a cool device that we can put right in front of them. Okay, but they're in middle school, so they go class to class, so we need it to be a small device. We need it to move. And so there's a million different, I shouldn't say million, there's like, I feel like there's like eight that I, you know, really think about um, as tool, like distance viewing tools that I like to use. And the reason for that is because the School for the Blind has them all available for trial. And I love it. It's the best program ever. I can borrow something for six months, try it out, return it if it doesn't work, borrow a different one, try it out. And when it works, be like, hey, district, this is the one. We tried five different things and this one's perfect. Now will you buy this $8,000 tool? And they're like, yeah, you put in a lot of work to finding the right one. And uh, you didn't just impulsively pick the one with all the bells and whistles. So that's how I like to do it. A uh, little bit of trial and error and get the kid involved in making the decision. What do you think about it? Is it better than the last one you used? Is it, um, does it have too much going on? Is it kind of com complicated and confusing? Or is it, do you wish it had more? Uh, can you record things? Can you take pictures? Um, this is a list of tons of types of assistive technology. There's e-readers, touch screens, speech recognition, word processors, there's braille notes and CCTVs and iPads and laptops and light boxes, the list goes on and on. Uh, the CCTVs are one of my favorite tools though. They will, they're essentially a camera that will blow up whatever you're viewing, whatever size you want on the screen in front of you. And you can change the contrast, the colors, you can have it take a picture or record it. There's ones that like on the bottom left, that one folds up like a laptop, really flat, super portable. There's ones like on the top left that, um, what am I looking at, top right? That uh, it's kind of a dinosaur. It kind of stays put where it's at. It doesn't move a whole lot. Uh, you might keep it in your kitchen or in your living room or in your kid's classroom. And your technology needs might, the needs might change throughout the years. Uh, there's a lot of low-tech devices out there. Um, one that we use a lot of the time is a reading stand to prop up materials, but you can use magnifiers, brails, graphic organizers, um, low tech or no tech. Uh, I won't go into all of that. I have here a picture of a great communication device. It's kind of an, a two by eight with large, I'd say hand sized picture cards that illuminate when you press them. Uh, things like elephant, giraffe, fish cheeseburger, eat. I don't know who's eating elephants and giraffes, but it looks like those are options on the meal today. <laughs> uh, we've got so many switches out there. There's Bluetooth switches that hook up to iPads. 
there's um, this this one switch on here has a little froggy bubble machine attached to it. And I love I love things like this for teaching cause and effect when the child is like, oh, when I push this button, the room fills up with bubbles. Like that is so exciting for a little kid. They love bubbles. And so um, they'll obviously want to push that button every chance they can, right? It's exciting and it helps teach this, um, you know, my actions have consequences, good ones or bad ones. I don't know. It, I guess you'll find out when you get there if they like bubbles. I've had people include their students in making smoothies with the blender. You can hook it up to anything. You can hook it up to music. Oh, music is like a big one for our students, right? A lot of kids love it. Um, you can hook it up to Christmas lights. They could have a switch for each of these things. So maybe they're uh, not verbal and they cannot say, can you turn on the cool lights and the cool music and all of that? But they can you know, roll over to the switches and start activating all of the switches that make them happy. So that's um, a wonderful way to get communication flowing. I think ultimately our kids want to feel like we understand what they want. And it's really difficult when you cannot verbalize what you are looking for. And it's got to just be such a relief when the adults around you understand um, that you are communicating something and uh, a lot of times I think it starts with switches. They have head switches. If you aren't using your hands, they've got elbow switches, feet switches. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll accept any kind of communication that could be, you know, eye blinking. It could be twitching. It could be just being mad when you don't like something maybe. So there's a lot of different ways to communicate. Switches are um, just one of my really favorite ones because they're so fun. There's a Cheap Talk 6. Uh, I've never used that one. It's a, a row of circle buttons with cards, picture cards above it. There's an auditory communicator button here that's uh, a square button that with a speaker on the top so you can record messages. Amazon also sells a four pack for like $13. I used one with my dog to communicate and it's like a it's like a 10 second communicator. I bought it for my dog and I was like, oh, my gosh, my students would like this even better. And so we've got switches for everything. You can put tactile um, uh, tactile uh, textures on them if they're not able to see to distinguish between the switches or you can put um, shiny things on there if your student has CVI. Uh, these are Trisha already talked about tactile communication symbols. These uh, these are ones that we had going for a while with one of my students, and I've used those before. These are available pre-made through American Printing House for the Blind. Um, they're awesome. They're great. And we've found that if you put them in a Velcro binder, you can carry the binder around. And, you know, we've got a page that pertains to all the um, extracurricular stuff, or we've got a page that's all about communication or one that's all about personal needs. Um, and they're they're vocabulary grows. And the idea is um, you offer some choices. Are you hungry or are you thirsty? And there's a, um, they, they make their choice, they pull it off and they hand it to you or however they want to indicate it to you. And I think it's just a, such a great way, even if there is some vision um, to, to kind of build that understanding. And a lot of times you're going to start with the real object first. So if your child is wearing diapers, then bathroom would be handing them the diaper and then eventually you would kind of reduce that to a piece of the diaper on a card and make sure that they have that connection of what that is so that's something your tvi can absolutely help with and co-team with the speech teacher uh some other really really great switch devices here and then what time do we give until 11 oh that's exciting all right uh orientation and mobility where you are, how to get where you want to go, uh, the skills that you need to get there. I have uh, some pictures here of students in line with a cane. There's a child trailing the wall with his hand in a gate trainer. There's a little boy in a wheelchair with some headphones and an iPad. Orientation and mobility looks different for everybody. Um, sometimes we have to explain very clearly why we're working on what we're working on. But at the end of the day, where would your child be if they didn't have orientation and mobility skills? Uh, just to give some examples of things that we cover, sighted guide, safe seating, room familiarizations, uh, recovering dropped objects without bumping your head on the table when you come back up. That's a big one for our little kids, especially. 
actually for our adults too. Everybody, everybody will walk into a cabinet from time to time. We all need O&M skills. <laughs> uh, how to use playground equipment safely, finding ways to the bathroom, getting to the bus stop, grocery shopping, detecting objects while you're moving, directional concepts, landmarks, clues, um, where numbers are located, motor development, canes, adaptive canes, push toys, protective arm techniques and trailing. And there's a really cute little kiddo here wearing one of those uh, adaptive canes that attaches around the waist. Um, and ultimately what we're trying to do here is help your child build their confidence and become more independent. Uh, getting exercise is a great aspect of orientation and mobility. It's really important for everyone to get some exercise. Um, but most importantly, we're trying to prepare them for their future so that they're able to do everything that they want to do. There's, there's nothing worse than them not being able to do what they want to do because they missed a skill. We want to make sure that they're not missing a skill as they get older. So some things to consider, we want to start them young. Um, for example, uh, a, a baby with typical vision would see maybe something on the other side of the room that they want to move towards, maybe mommy or a, a toy or the dog's tail, something, something they want to go interact with. And that motivates them enough to move across the ground and um, develop the skill of crawling. But when you can't see what's across the room, the motivation isn't the same. And so your orientation and mobility instructor is going to be really helpful with finding things to motivate your child um, and helping build that connection between a sound that they hear and the physical object, like a rattle. Uh, and it's it might take longer, but it's absolutely worth uh, the wait and allowing them to problem solve. Uh, your student may or may not be driving. There's, uh, I feel like Wisconsin has some stricter laws for licensure than uh, than some of the other states with, as far as bioptic driving goes. But you absolutely do not need a car to get through this life. Um, we, a lot of us, grow up with a dependency on cars, and so it seems like, oh my gosh, you can't drive. That's that's everything. But it's not. <laughs> my sister is fully sighted, and she's never gotten her license. She's years older than me. So <laughs> it's okay. You don't need it. There's great bus systems out there. There's um, Ubers, things like that. There's safe ways to, to travel around. So we want to teach your student all of those ways and let them figure out what they feel the most comfortable with. Um, I've even taken kids to the airport before just because they were curious, like, what's it like when I want to fly? We did not leave the country. We did not fly, but we. I would. I would, but the school district wouldn't let me. <laughs> Um, essential skills like just crossing the street, listening to traffic and finding out when um, when it is safe to make your crossing. There's so many, so many skills that go into it. And your O&M instructor can break it down for you and help take videos of your child or invite you on lessons so you can see how to do it and how to reinforce it at home. Um, that's This is a page with a bunch of gate trainers and um, interesting standers and walkers. Um, like I said, orientation and mobility, you don't necessarily have to be walking to acquire these skills. There's a lot uh, involved with navigation and um, your your understanding of where you are. And if you are in a wheelchair, being able to express where you want to go instead of someone just pushing you and not, um, not being happy with where they're taking you, how can you advocate for, no, I don't need your help. I don't want your help in a nice way where we don't make enemies, but you know, sometimes you got to it's okay to burn some bridges once in a while if you need to. <laughs> All right. Uh, your role as parents in supporting orientation and mobility, uh, it's going to take longer and be patient. Um, if you think about you yourself walking down the hall of your house, going to the bathroom, you know, charging through, confident. In the middle of the night, it's pitch black. You might move a little bit slower. So just understand that it's different sometimes. Um that's not true for all of our students. Some of our some of our students are just so speedy and confident, and it scares us. But we we love that kind of confidence. Uh, help help foster that confidence and give give them trust and faith, and let them let's see what they can do with that. Uh, you know, whatever the O and M instructor says they're working on, try to enforce that at home. Uh, one of one of the things that always looks interesting when I'm in a school is they'll another teacher will walk by and they'll see my student kind of um, bumping around, not 
not walking down the hall confidently kind of lost, um, almost seems like they're, you know, in a corner trying to like figure out their way. And I look like it's a terrible teacher because it's like, what is this lady doing standing here not doing anything while this child is clearly lost? And I, th what they don't know is I already had a conversation with my student where I said, if I am not helping you, it's not because I'm evil. I'm not a bad teacher. I'm helping you develop the skills that I can't really teach you. And that is how to get yourself out of a pickle. And that is how to, when your teacher isn't there to be like, oh, nope, not that way. Oh, go to your left. If they don't help you with that, then you have to figure it out for yourself. But we still want our children to be supported and safe and watched. And uh, this is kind of the way that we start to do it. So uh, I always have an interesting time explaining <laughs> what I'm doing there. But it's it's really important. You're going to feel like that as parents, too, is what I'm trying to um, share with you is someone might look at you and you might feel them judging you because you're allowing your child to make mistakes right in front of you, but they need to be able to do that. Don't just take them by the hand and guide them. Let them get a little lost. And uh, I promise you're better parents when you do that. You're not evil. And you can have a conversation with your child about that and be like, hey, uh, this is how I'm helping you. This is, I, I have to do this. Courtney told me at this conference that I have to do it. So you can go take it up with court. That's fine. Put it on me. I'll have a conversation with them about why they need to do it themselves and getting lost is part of the process. Um, this is a fun little activity. Uh, if you guys are up for it, uh, there's a picture here of a classroom, but the activity is describing this classroom to somebody who's visually impaired. And I'm going to invite you guys to um, share how you would describe it. Don't be shy. No wrong answers, but just some tips. Uh, you know, someone who's blind or visually impaired. They might be curious about the colors and decorations, but for the most part, the nuts and bolts that are the most important are the layout, potential hazards and obstacles, and uh, important points of interest in the room. So do we have any brave souls who would like to try to describe what they see in this picture? Oh, come on. Come on, somebody. Yes. Kind of inconclusive. It's not the best picture in the world. Mm -hmm. That was beautiful. You're so brave. That was wonderful. So as an orientation and mobility instructor, we would give verbal descriptions, but we would also go through with our child and um, have them walk around the perimeter. There's different techniques for room familiarization that we would go through and uh, and continue with the verbal. But it has to go on many times, I think, for a child to really understand their environment. So a lot of times we'll start during extended school year if they're going to a new school and we'll get them up to speed so that by the time they get there, they know where the bathroom is, just like every other kid who literally just walked through the halls, noticed where the bathroom is, and they're good. That took 10 seconds for those kids to learn where the bathroom is. A child with a visual impairment might take weeks, and it's important to get those services so that on the first day of school, they know where the bathroom is too. Um, it's, I mean, they might not still be ready for that. They might still not have that understanding, but we have to work towards it so that they are um, closing the gap between what their sighted peers are doing and what they are still working on. So some final thoughts that I have for you, uh, since I'm literally on the soapbox here, uh, advocate for what you think your child needs. I know you guys are hearing that from everybody and you're not a squeaky wheel us teachers love it when the parents get involved. It's really hard when parents aren't involved. Extended school year, a lot of districts are very modest about the amount of extended school year they give. Uh, a lot of times they'll say things like, we don't have enough data to prove that they need extra over the summer. But emerging skills count too. 
And if your child is emerging on something in, in a skill that they really need, like Braille, for example, or, um, you know, understanding the room or, you know, there's, there's many different uh, keyboarding. If they cannot proceed with their peers until they master that skill, to me, that counts as an emerging skill. And you can argue that. And um, I think that it's really important to try to get your kids some ESY. A lot of times it's helpful to do it periodically throughout the summer. It might just look like a session every week. It might be, um, you know, two weeks right before school starts, just like a little refresher so that they're up to speed. It could be different. Your IEP team will help you decide what's best. But a lot of times uh, I've noticed that districts don't even really throw it on the table because they are very modest with it. I see some people nodding their heads because they might know from experience and uh, they're not evil. They just don't understand the importance of what you are trying to accomplish with your child. And uh, so that's, there's a lot of people out there that can help support you as you want to have those conversations. You can always reach out to us too. Um, your curiosity about what your kid's doing is huge. Your family's curiosity, your, you know, the child's cousins, if they can get curious about the technology and want to interact and send emails and learn how to use this cool tool that they have, play game, like that is so huge. Don't be like, ooh, I don't know, that's too high tech. I don't know, school knows how to use it. That's a braille no touch. I don't know, it's really complicated. Like get involved, get, get into it and like ask your kid to show you what they have been learning <laughs> and you don't even have to be able to do it. Just ask them to show you. Um, it makes a big difference. <laughs> okay, I have a quote for myself. I always tell my students, I work for you. I tell that to my third graders. I tell that to my eighth graders, my high school students. I do because uh, whatever they are communicating to me that they want, whether they are um, verbal, nonverbal, a lot of my kids are really have great verbal skills and they're very great advocates for what they want. And I am constantly trying to keep up with them. They're like, I wanna learn how to do this thing on the iPad. And I'm like, okay give me a minute here. And I go home and I learn how to do it so I can teach it to them because technology changes so fast that I have to keep up. But uh, I will not be the one that stands in the way of them learning something. And so my philosophy and many of us, all of us, I'd say is ask and you shall receive. If you don't ask, you might receive. We try to cover all the bases. We try to make our best choices for our students and uh, include you in the process. But if you are like, oh, okay, this OrCam thing is really cool, but I don't know if we can justify it for school use, bring it up. Like, we'll we'll look into it. We'll see if we can try it out for a little bit. And if it really helps, then, then that's worth it. Uh, oh, I have a, a an amazing typo on this. I love American. That. That's what I was laughing about. Oh, yes. Okay, American Printing House for the bling. <laughs> it's so perfect. It I wish I did it on purpose <laughs> because it is like ching ching. I love American Printing House for the blind because they work with us on federal quota funds. If your child is legally blind or functionally blind with like CVI, they count for, they they qualify for federal quota funding from the government. And that helps pay for tons of great stuff from the American Printing House. If they are not, uh, if they do not qualify, they still deserve the things that help them. The school district just has to pay for it. Mm -hmm. But it is like our treasure trove that we always mm -hmm. like, oh, you need something? Let's see what's on the website right here. Oof. Cause it's always nice when you don't have to make it yourself. Um, and they, it's also nice when you don't have to ask the district. <laughs> it is nice. But yeah, if your child needs it, it doesn't matter who's paying for it. Yeah. It's a need. Put it in the IEP, advocate for it and be like, well, I get that that's expensive, but that's what they need. Yeah. Your TVI will help you advocate for all of that. You should never be standing alone, feeling like it's you against the world. Uh, the Wisconsin Council for the Blind and Vision Forward are awesome resources that I've gotten to utilize. I like to bring my students there. They get to meet other people who are visually impaired. They get to see all the cool tools out there and actually get their hands on them because a lot of times you don't even get to really touch the interesting things until you go to a conference or actually purchase them online. And um, it's really nice to have those things in person. And then finally, I just cannot say enough good things about the Wisconsin Center for the Blind and Visually Impaired. Their outreach team is amazing. I Everything I ever need, there are answers there. And if they don't have the answers, they hunt them down for us. And you as a parent should be on their, on their email. You should be a part of it. You should bring your kid there as much as you can to meet other kids for their short courses and their small um, gatherings and their 
big ones, whatever, whatever they do, try to get involved because it can feel so lonely when you're the only child at a public school with a visual impairment. And uh, it's just really nice to know that there's other people out there and to make some parent connections. And I'm sure you guys have all been, you know, meeting other parents that you can relate to. And it's just, it's one of the most important things. And uh, one of the things I love about our vision community, because it is a very uh, tight knit group, all of the vision teachers know each other, all of, you know, all the parents, you guys are going to see each other pop up throughout each other's lives. It's, it's a wonderful thing. So this is, uh, do you have anything to add? I just have one thing to add. Um, as a person, I was a teacher, a classroom teacher for 20 years. And in those 20 years, I only had three students who had visual impairments. Um, our company is called Low Incidence. It is really low incidence. So don't assume that your child's teacher understands your child's visual impairment. Be that person who educates that teacher or those teachers of your child as a team of teachers. Don't be embarrassed. Don't you know, don't assume that they're going to read that IEP cover to cover when they've got, you know, 25 other kids in the classroom. You need to be the one that's advocating and, and educating that teacher on what your child's impairment is, um, what they need. One of the things I really like to do with my kids on my caseload is to have them every year make a PowerPoint of some kind explaining their visual impairment and sharing that with the teachers, you know, this is what helps me. This is what makes school really difficult for me. You know, you can put in pictures of your child. And I mean, if you have a child who's nonverbal, who isn't able to do those things, you can do it for them in their own, you know, you can put it in their voice, send it to those teachers ahead of time. So the teacher really has a beginning understanding um, of what to expect with your child. And it's not that teachers don't want to do the best for your child. It's just that, Honestly, like I said, as a teacher, visual impairments are very rare to have in a general ed classroom. They're just not that common. And um, we'd love to learn about your child's visual impairment. We just probably don't know about it and have never experienced it. So do we have any questions? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, there's that Trish sent out, I can ask her to like resend that information to you all. Excellent. And yes. Like social anxiety about people. just older and he's like, you know, if he has a minimal visual impairment, people don't notice, you just want them to notice, and then it's more of a more resistance. What are what are people? I ask myself that every day. Uh, yeah. my first strategy is get them excited when they're young. That's really helpful. Um, but sometimes by the time, you know, we, we get a student or by the time we, they even get evaluated because no one realized how significant their visual impairment was. And they're like, oh yeah, so-and-so's not doing so well in math. And then you're like, that's because they're 2200. What are you? You're in sixth grade. No, that's like my nightmare. Yeah. It is. And, uh, <laughs> and then you're like, here, use this really fancy equipment. And they're like, absolutely not. I am absolutely not. not. That. And they won't even wear a jacket. You know what that is? <laughs> it's like, yes. I can expect them to want to. Mm -hmm. I know. Sometimes you just have to wait them out too. Yeah. It's unfortunately, it can, it can be waiting it out until it's, um, until they get to a point where it's literally not working for them anymore. Mm -hmm. And they're like, okay, fine. I guess I have to. Um, and then I feel like there's also some, you can kind of get into their head a little bit and, and kind of be like, you know, like you don't have to use this forever, but I have to teach it to you. So let's, let me, let me show it to you. And once you show me that you know how to use it perfectly, then you can decide if it works for you or not. I really, I'm not big on forcing people to use things. Um, if you want to walk up to the front of class and copy <laughs> off the board to get your work done, if you think that's less embarrassing than using a CCTV, then fine. You know, if that's, I don't, I don't want them to do that, but I'm not in charge of their life. Um, so, and then, you know, eventually they'll maybe be more embarrassed by going up to the board really close than they would be at, I don't know. Everyone's so different, you know, and, um, some people here's, here's another thing. Sometimes we think something's best for them and we think they need it. And we're like, this will help you. This will magnify it. But what if we're wrong? Just because that's what we feel would help them. Uh, what if they can see it enough and they're fine. And when they say, 
dad, leave me alone. I'm fine. Like maybe they mean it. Um, as kids get older, you kind of have to take their word for it a little bit. Um, there's also incentive incentives. You know, if you use this every day during this time, I will get you a chocolate milkshake at the end of the week. I'm not against that. Um, <laughs> I yeah. bring candy. Candy. Well, you know, good. Going on the internet and for people have sent up stuff like a skateboarder using a cane. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love that. And to build on that, take your child to one of these places that has the tools to try out and you can offer them options to be like, would this be better for you? Do you think, would you like that better? And it's like the same thing in a different color, maybe. Well, I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, kids can be tricky sometimes. And uh, whatever it is that gets them excited about it. Um, also, there's a million ways to accomplish a task. So maybe we want them to use, use large print, but they will absolutely not be caught dead using large print. That is a huge one that we have had to deal with. Um, and it's like, well, will you at least keep this little dome magnifier on your desk? Okay. And then you look over and they're reading an entire novel with their dome magnifier. And it's like, if that's what floats your boat, you know, I like our job, the way that I look at it is to give you all of the resources and then for you to pick what works best for you and fits your lifestyle. Maybe you'll change your mind down the road, but you can't say I didn't teach you the CCTV at least. So one of my students just got um, an iPhone that has the double screens. And he's like so excited because again, he's a high schooler. He does not want to be caught dragging a big CCTV from class to class, but you know, he is fine enlarging things on the iPhone. Um, one of the things I wanted to say, one of my recent, the, one of the recent issues that I've had with some of my older students. And again, this is something to have a conversation with the teacher about is a lot of teachers in middle school and high school give kids time in class to work on things. And you know, even with a CCTV with stuff like that, we're giving them this ability to enlarge things, but oftentimes like they have to do research, different things like that on the internet, they can enlarge things on the computer, but they're only enlarging a section of a page. So the amount of time that it takes them to research the whole thing compared to their peers is extreme. Like my high schoolers have to spend, you know, four times longer. So those 20 minutes in class that they're given, by the time they get things enlarged, it's useless. And that's really an important thing to bring up to a teacher who has only had your kid in their class ever with a visual impairment and say, you know, this really isn't fair that my kid has to go home and spend two hours on this thing that took the kids in your classroom 20 minutes. You know, those are the kind of things as a parent you need to advocate for some kind of modifications for because um, we don't want that for your kids. You know, it's just not, it, we want to level the playing field as much as we possibly can. There's not a bad TVI in the bunch. We are all super committed. We love what we do. Please involve us in everything with your child. And thank you for coming. If you have more questions, please feel free to come on up and chat with Trisha and I. It is Earth Day, so there's a really nice river walk right behind the building here. It's about a quarter of a mile if you do the whole thing. It's really pretty outside. There's a river. Um, so, yeah, get, get in touch with nature. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. And Thank you.